Chevy Bible, turn the Gospel of John, chapter 7. John, chapter number 7, and verse 37. Scripture says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The Apostle John puts this narrative now beneath the words of Christ. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Bless this book now, Father, and give this servant, Lord, what I need to preach it this morning. In thy name, amen. You can be seated. What you're looking at here in the Gospel of John, chapter number 7, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, the Lord Jesus uh, was there at the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, one of the seven feasts ordained by the Holy Spirit with Israel. They've added a couple since then, but seven, according to the scripture, the Feast of Tabernacles is called Sukkoth, or the Feast of Booths. And it's a time when Israel makes these little booths and they get in them and they remember where they came from and then they look forward to the future. It's kind of like the Lord's Supper that we have here. Israel had seven feast days. They had the Passover, the unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and then tabernacles. Tabernacles was the last feast of Israel on their calendar of the year. That's important. If you notice in verse number 37, it says, in the last day, that great day of the feast. There's considerable uh, controversy about exactly what day they're talking about here, but some believe, and it may very well be the eighth day, which may, therefore we go through a week of the Feast of Tabernacles, and on the eighth day, we have the last day, which really in reality is a new day, because the number eight in Scripture is the number of new beginnings. In plain words, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the new beginner, he's the one who begins, starts, pre and, 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 pre and prevails. Uh, he stepped forward on this feast, and he said something that's quite remarkable, because he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now, Moses could never say that, nor could any of the prophets say that that because they're not the source of anything except the truth that God gave them. But everything that we need is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything. Everything. And it's not so much of what he gives us, it's who he is to us. And that's an issue. Think about what I just said to you. They were Israel, the feast given to Israel to teach them about their history and their relationship with God. The last feast was, was, uh, was worshipped and or, ordained like like this. They would go down to the pool of Siloam and they would gather in golden vessels the water from the pool of Siloam and then they would bring it back up to the altar and there they would offer it. They would pour it out as an offering to God. The word Siloam in Hebrew means sent. It's important to understand the Apostle John is talking about sent. The word apostolo where we get the word apostle means a sent one and it means means far more than simply the word sent in English. And we'll deal with that in just a few minutes. In the book of Psalm chapter number 113, when they brought that up, they would sing this. When they brought that water up from the pool of Siloam, it was, they would sing what's called the Hillel. And I want to read just a couple of verses for you. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. He's high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is likened to 
of the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. That is a song of praise. It's a psalm of praise. And if you want to be lifted up out of, the, out of your doldrums or out of your, out of your you know, depression, begin to praise the Lord. And if you don't know what to say, read the 113th Psalm as they approach to the Almighty and you'll find out what's going on. Thousands were singing that psalm on that day. It became one of the, one of the most joyous occasions of Israel in the whole year. Amen. The water was taken from the pool of Siloam. The writer wants you to know that because it's important and it's based upon the glorification. Notice carefully what what he says over here in John 7. He says, but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive. You say, well, preacher, why didn't God just give them the Holy Spirit? John chapter number three, the spirit was poured out upon them and they spake in other tongues, other languages. Wasn't this the giving of the Holy Spirit? Not like this. We have things that are important when you study the Bible and understand the the dispensational aspect of what's going on. And you'll find out what's happening here. It's something that's very important to understand. The water was sent. God, John chapter number seven, John, lead, John seven, John leads us into chapter number nine. In the ninth chapter of the gospel of John, there was a man born blind. You remember him? The man born blind? And you remember that man born blind was cast out of the synagogue. The Lord Jesus Christ took spittle of clay, rubbed it on his eyes, and told him to go down to the place sent. Go down to the pool of Siloam. Go down to the water that was sent from God. There's a reason for that pool. God God's got a reason for calling it Siloam. They've just recently discovered, the archaeologists have, that it was much larger than they thought. It's still there, the pool of Siloam. He went, he washed, and he came seeing. What happened? He washed the curse away from his eyes. And now he's able to see. He becomes an object lesson for Israel under the curse. They cannot see. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But once the Holy Spirit, which is saved, once he washes that ignorance and that unbelief away, they're able to sin. This is why there'll be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will wash away the blindness and the ignorance of Israel. And they'll look upon him whom they've pierced. They'll mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Then they will see that which they have rejected all oh, for so long. The apostles were sent and when they were sent forth, they were sent with life and light. And that's what the pool of Siloam brings. That's what an apostle is. Notice carefully, when the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he chose 12. And he made apostles out of them. And he sent them. He said, I send you as my Father hath sent me, so I commission you. So I give you power and authority over unclean spirits. All of that was based upon his incarnation. It was based upon God becoming man. And because he had become man by being in this world, he took authority over Satan and upon every demon of hell. And they shuddered and trembled at his word and at his sight. The Lord Jesus Christ was sent. John chapter number three said plainly, he said, the father hath sent me. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says about him. Chapter number three and verse number one. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called an apostle. The word means the sent one with authority from God. And we'll move into that in just a moment. Now I want you to look at what's going on here. The Holy Spirit was not yet given, but this was taking place at Moriah. This is Moriah. The Old Testament word Moriah is a Hebrew word that means where God sees and God will be seen. It's important because God was seen at Moriah when Abraham carried his son up to the top of that mountain to offer him as a sacrifice unto God. There you see the father manifested at Moriah. It was there the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite 
where a separation takes place. Whether you like it or not, when you walk out of that building today, there will be a separation that takes place. Those of you who are written in the Lamb's book of life and those of you who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, to the Lord God this morning, I would that you'd understand before you walk out of this building today, if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, why don't you come this morning and ask him to save your soul and write your name in that Lamb's book of life. It was a place of separation. Separation. We have seen the sun at Moriah. Think about it. Where God sees and God will be seen. We saw the father at Moriah. Now we see the son at Moriah. What do you mean? When he was nailed on a cross. Christ and his cross are inseparable. That's his ministry. That's his word. That's his, that's his message to all of mankind. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't come to make you better. He didn't come to make you rich. He didn't come to make you happy. He came to die on a cross for your sin. That you could be saved and your name could be written in the Lamb's book of life. Once you receive the gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, all of these other things are simply they're just something thing that you may have some and you may not have some but they're incidental. All that matters is that your name is in the book of life by Christ Jesus our Lord at the cross. So we see the sun at the cross. We see the sun at Moriah. But now we're about to see the Holy Spirit at Moriah. Amen. God the Father we see at Moriah. God the Son we see at Moriah. And now we're going to see the Son at Moriah. And what's he say to us here in John chapter number 7? Look carefully at the word. But this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. When this Holy Spirit comes, he's going to come not simply as the Spirit was in the Old Testament where he came upon men and he left men and David said take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Same Holy Ghost. God doesn't change. He's forever and ever and ever the same yesterday, today and forever. He was the Holy Spirit manifest to man in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters but there's something different that the apostle wants you to understand in John chapter number 7. And what is that preacher? That he was glorified. He was glorified. By when the Bible says that he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That was the first step in his glorification. Amen. And I'm sure all the devils of hell hated that. Here we have the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven come down to earth and was incarnate in flesh. The God man did not come down from heaven. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven. But the God man ascended back to heaven. And now the angels that watched him leave are watching him come back up. This is the ascension of Christ. That's a big deal. In the book of Psalm chapter number 24, it says this, verse number 3. Psalm 24 and verse number 3. Very important words and beautiful words indeed. Psalm 24 and verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation so the Lord Jesus Christ my friend on his second step of glorification when he ascended from the earth the disciples watched him in Acts chapter number one watched him ascend from the earth no carefully the earth is cursed it's all cursed the ground you walk upon is cursed so the ground once he my friend had arisen from the dead had become sin for us who knew no sin it was clean it was gone he was empty of it and now it could hold him no more and up from the earth he arose the earth could not touch him again my friend when he comes down from heaven he'll come back down to the Mount of Olives and when he puts that foot upon the earth that mountain will shake and quake and split right asunder because the foot of the Son of God now 
now has touched this cursed planet and it can't hold him. Amen. 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 He ascended. The Bible said in Psalm chapter number 24, verse number seven, it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up the everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. One side of the angels and one side of the seraphim and the cherubim cry out. Listen to what they say. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And what's called an antiphony. It's a voice speaking against a voice. On the other side, here's what they say to those who say that. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle, the other side answers. And then they say again, lift up your heads, ye gates. Even lift them up. Ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And then the other side says again, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he's the King of glory. Selah. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that the face of a man that did not exist in heaven, but has ascended from the earth by his own righteousness, he's the second person of the Trinity. Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. And then he ascended. Here's a man. Here's a man. Here's a man ascending into the very presence of God. And the angels cry to each other, what's going on here? What's happening in our presence? And up he comes. He ascends. And he ascends to the right hand of the Father. And then in Psalm chapter number 1 verse, Psalm 110 verse 1 the third stage of his glorification and that's his enthronement in Psalm 110 verse 1 the Lord said to my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool passing before the righteous eyes of almighty God before the holy one holy 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 is the Lord God almighty not would I would not dare this morning to even try to approach him without the Lord Jesus Christ amen but the son of God the man Christ Jesus Jesus, the God man has now passed two stages. He's in the third. He's coming into the very presence of Almighty God. He that can see through you. He knows you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. There is no, my dear friend, no deception with this being, this almighty, absolute, eternal being. And he looks at him, his son, but now he's the God man, his son. And he says, sit down, son, at my right hand. And he sits down and he's accepted accepted by his own righteousness into the presence of the Father. Psalm chapter number 45 says it this way. The Bible says in Psalm 45 and verse number 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is this right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The consummation, the highest place that can be placed, the highest place of enthronement and glorification is when Father Almighty, the Father Almighty, looks over at his Son, and calls him God. That's quite a thing. <laughs> That's quite a thing. And so therefore, based upon this glorification, based upon this ascension, based upon this declaration that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh, he now is given authority to send the Holy Spirit down into this world. The Holy Spirit comes not only with a commission, but with power and authority. When the Holy Spirit comes down, he comes down in a way that he's never been in this world before. He comes down as the sent one, as the apostle. He comes down from heaven. He sent for Christ. Christ has been glorified and that's who you have dwelling in you this morning if you're born of the Spirit of God. And let me tell you right now, if the Holy Ghost is in you, I don't have to tell you he's in you. Nobody has to tell me who's in my soul. Nobody's going to tell me what happened to me in here this morning. I know whom I have believed. There's somebody a whole lot bigger than I am. Amen. Oh, that we'd get a hold of that. God help us that we'd understand that. You say, preacher, I've tried everything. You haven't tried God yet. You try him, get on your knees, pour your heart out, open your soul, and he'll do for you what no man can do for you. Uh, be able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. So in John chapter number 7 and verse number 38, here's what it says. <laughs> when he comes, in John chapter number 7, and look at verse number 38. 
Now, if you notice now, the apostle says, this spake of the spirit, which they that believe should receive. Notice in verse 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. See this? You're not the source of those, that, that, the, the, the belly, the rivers of living water. They don't originate with you. They originate with who's in you. The Holy Ghost has come into you. And the Holy Ghost is God. And the Holy Ghost, my dear friend, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, there's no way that you can deplete his, his sufficiency, his what he has for you. It's all there and never ending. He comes up within you. He rises up within you. You feel something within your soul. There's a movement of God in your heart. How long has it been, dear Christian friend, that you felt God move in your soul? How long? How long has it been since you've been on your knees and you prayed and you asked God to do something to help your dead cold condition? When was the last time you, that you, my friend, will accept the responsibility for your own righteousness, your own walk with God, your own faith, and quit blaming somebody else? Some of you think that if you don't have a scheduled revival, if you don't have a man come in, some of you think that if you don't have that, that there can be no revival. My friend, find that in the Bible. That's not in the book. Your revival is in your hands between you and God. The Bible said, draw near to God, draw close to God. He'll draw near unto you. If I came in here twice dead, plucked up by the roots, a wall separating me in fellowship with the Lord, and somebody preached this to me, I'd get up and say, Lord God, I want those waters of Bethlehem again. I want to feel the Holy Ghost in my soul. I want my joy back. And God would give it to you if you ask him. It's there. It's there for all of us. So the Bible said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You remember the rivers of Babylon? You remember a pagan land where they said, sing us the songs of Zion? Wonder why they wanted to hear the songs of Zion. You suppose that if you got a hold of a real Christian song, that it would be different from what they're playing out here? How many of you know that? How many of you know that yet? That there is a vast, well, I love what they play out here. Then you're not listening to Christian music. There is power in Christian music that glorifies God. There's a spirit attached to it. And they said to them in Babylon, sing for us the songs of Zion. And the children of Israel in captivity said, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? So they hung their harps upon the willows. There we are by the rivers of Babylon. What do you mean by the rivers of death? Death, a river can bring life or it can bring death. Have you got a river in you? I've got one in me. A river that never runs dry. Oh, yes, thank God. Yes, for the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. For by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. You don't need to pray to God to give you the Holy Ghost after you're supposed to be saved. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit of God. That's an impossibility. So if you're born again, you have the Holy Ghost. There's the water from the rock. Wasn't that sweet? There's the water that followed them. You remember that in 1 Corinthians 10? We talked about that the other day. Then there's Ezekiel's river. There's a river of water that comes up from the throne of God. Now the pool of Siloam, the water of Siloam, you know where it originates? It comes out of the throne of God. It comes up from the ground. It comes up through the rock. And it flows down into that pool like it's sent. You see, it's got a place of origin. It's got a place of holiness, a place of power. And up it comes. If you came today and said, Lord God, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I've tried it and tried it and tried it. I cannot live the Christian life. You can't and I can't. I say, preacher, I just, I just don't have it. You don't and I don't. What we need is the Holy Spirit of God to live in us for him. And so pray to him. Then there is the river of Ezekiel. It flows beneath the holy mount. Comes out shallow when it starts. It gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Until it flows through that place where he puts his feet down. Splits asunder on top of that mountain. And the waters flow through. And they flow down to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is healed. Why? Because of the river of the water of life. Everything the water of life touches, it heals and gives life. Hey Amen. You say, preacher, I just don't have any life in me. Appreciate you being honest. <laughs> I've never said that since I've been saved. Been dead times, cold times, out of fellowship with the Lord times. But my dear friend, the Holy Spirit has never left me. Never left me. But then finally, there's the river, the water of life. 
This flows out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. So here's the dispensational picture of what you just read. The picture then is of Israel in the millennium. Speaking forth life-giving words to a thirsty world. That's what the booth represents, millennium, when they're elevated once again to the height of all the nations. So where's the church, preacher? You're reigning with him for a thousand years, glorified bodies with him. Death can't touch you. You've already got a body that's going to live forever. And you're watching the Holy Spirit as he works for a thousand years on mankind. On this. There's reason for all that. That's a different message entirely. That's the ultimate fulfillment. But the present fulfillment of this shall be a well of life springing up inside you is this. When you speak, you should be speaking life. When people get around you, they die or do they live? Well do you have within your heart that which is good and you love the Lord Jesus? You've got a spirit within you that draws people. Did you know that? Did you know, listen to me? Please listen. Humility draws people. They're drawn to it like a magnet. Because they're drawn to somebody that they understand who understands themselves. And they're just like them. And they know that there's got to be somebody bigger than them to take care of them. Amen. That's what humility is about. And they draw them. But you fill yourself full of pride and people will be rebelled. Right. Amen. Rebelled. They'll be rebelled by it. So what is your life speaking? Are you witnessing? First witness that you give to people is the way you live your life. I know why some of you won't witness at work because they watch the way you live. <laughs> You'd be like Lot over there in Sodom when he tried to witness to his sons-in-laws. They thought he was mocking. Well, all of a sudden now do you get religious. We need to be witnessing to people, folks, time short. You need to be bringing people to church. Have you noticed that we're trying to reach these children? Have you noticed that? Did you realize that in every generation, in every culture, God opens a door and makes a way so that his word can go out and go forth? And that's what's left to us here in America is through the children. You can reach the parents. The parents will come for their children. We want the parents and we want the children both. We want them to know the Lord. Amen. Do you support the church? Do you support it in its meetings? Do you support it when we have something for the kids. Do you bring your kids to it? Are you part of what's going on in here? Are you part of what's happening? Or are you a, are, are you a, a what do they call them on streaming over there? I don't know what would be a good name for them. Uh, streaming, uh, streamer, uh, it's good for those who watch the streaming. Thank God for you. This is nothing against you, but some of you people watching streaming ought to be right here. Amen. Because you can sit here and you can comfort one another can pray for one another. This is the church of God. You see, that it's good we have it, but that's not the church. This is the church. Here's my song. And I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> I want you to be here when I'm done. <laughs> but here's my song. I've already figured out what I can do to torture somebody I doesn't like. Lock him up in the room, sing to him for 100 years. Amen. I guarantee it to send him off to La La Land. Hear the heart of heaven beating. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the hush of mercy breathing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Hear the host of angels sing, glory to the newborn king, and the sounding joy repeating, Jesus saves. See the humblest hearts adore him, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the wisest bow before him, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. See the sky alive with praise, melting darkness in its place. There is life forevermore. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He will live our sorrow sharing. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. He will die our burden bearing. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. It is done. We'll shout the cross. Christ has paid redemption's cost while the empty tomb's declaring. Jesus saves. Freedom's calling. Chains are falling. Hope is dawning. Bright and true. Day is breaking. Night is quaking. God is making all things new. Jesus saves. Oh, to grace how great a debtor 
Jesus saves, Jesus saves, all the saints who shout together. I know that Jesus saves, rising up so vast and strong, lifting up salvation song. The redeemed will sing forever. The redeemed will sing forever. The redeemed will sing forever. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Have you been saved? Neither is there salvation in any other. Nor their name under heaven given among men. Whereby we must be saved. But the name of Jesus. Bow your head. Father in Jesus name. I've done what the messenger does Lord. Done all the power the messenger has. I've done what a messenger could call to thee to do. But Heavenly Father it's in your hands. Let the sweet Holy Spirit. The one sent Lord in power. Sent commission God. The sent one. Let him that has come within us. Father, I pray that you'd bless your word today to the hearts of the people. In thy holy name, I pray. In thy holy name. Anybody in the house this morning, raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, I want you to pray for me because I'm not saved. I'm not saved. God bless you back there. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else pray? Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Anybody else raise your hand and say, pray for me. I'm not saved. Pray for me, preacher. I'm not saved. How about pray for me, preacher? I'm not sure I'm saved. Anybody like that in here? We're not here to condemn you, drag you down here at this altar. Nobody's going to do that. God bless you back there. Anybody else raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher? Don't know, not sure if I'm saved or not. Anybody? Father, I pray for them now. Lord, we have an enemy. We know that. We have an enemy. He hates this. He hates the spirit of God. He hates your word. And he hates the soul of men. And Father, I pray this morning now, the sweet Holy Spirit will do for them what no one else can do. Point them to Christ. Bring them to the Savior. Bring them to the one who died, rose again, and his finished work can wash their sins away. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up this morning.